All right, everybody, this is Ross. Welcome back um, to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night, 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, you know, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, and then also how to grow it. And some of the weird, more interesting fruits and vegetables that you guys may never have heard of. What I really love to do is give you guys my perspective on growing food. You know, I'm uh, in a not necessarily a really unique perspective. I think um, there's a lot of people just like me who are trying to grow food. Um, some of you guys might not be the same age as me or maybe in the same um, situation. Maybe you guys have more land. Maybe you have less land. Um, but for the most part, I think we can all sort of use my perspective, uh, the experience that I've been gaining over the last, I don't know, it's been six or seven years now or something like that, um, to really help you guys out. You know, I think that's really one of the, the best things about having a YouTube channel, about having an audience, about having this podcast. Um, I can't tell you how many people just legitimately are happy, um, to have this information in front of them. Uh, I think, I, I don't <laughs> I don't know. I, it just makes me, it puts a smile on my face um, every time some of you guys message me and say, hey, you know, Ross, I want to thank you. You saved me some money. Um, your information has really helped me out, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it really does make things uh, a lot happier in my life. And speaking of being happier, uh, my life has just been going really well. Um, first off, we talked in the last two episodes of Fruit Talk about health, and we talked about actually eating better. Really, what what I did was I I've been doing an elimination diet. I haven't been eating gluten. I haven't been eating dairy, and I'm telling you, I feel so much better. It's it's dramatic. It's a huge dramatic change in um, almost. I can name off ten different things in my of my life. You know. Um, Certainly my mood, I'm happier, less anxious. Um, I have very little to no allergies anymore, which I've had for pretty much my entire life. Um, my mind's sharper. I mean, you guys can maybe even tell just by listening to me. I'm, I might even be a little bit quicker, a um, little bit faster pace. Although, to be honest with you, as these podcasts go on, I start to slow down just simply because you know, I'm sort of introverted in that sense. And if I'm talking for more than 45 minutes, I start to fall off a cliff. But, uh, the point is, is that, uh, I'm certainly a little bit, uh, quicker, you know, I'm, I feel a little bit smarter, honestly. I, f I feel like I have better memory. Um, it's pretty, it's just a dramatic, really a dramatic change. Uh, I even been losing a little bit of weight around my midsection. I remember I saw a video of myself, um, this is, I guess, what I look like in my most recent form here, if anyone's interested. But I saw a video of myself uh, like three years ago. And it was actually three years ago, almost to this month. And I couldn't believe actually how thin I looked. Um, not that I'm not really thin right now, but as I've gotten older, I've definitely, I'm sure many of you have experienced this throughout your life, is that as you get older, you just start to slowly gain weight, you know? And I got over a certain age and I thought, well, I'm just at a certain age now and I guess this is just normal. This is just what's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to very slowly gain weight. It's supposed to be, you know, more and more difficult. Obviously it is more and more difficult to maintain your weight, but um I don't think it has to be, really. I don't I don't I feel honestly at this point like I'm twenty two again. I'm twenty nine right now. Um I legitimately have lost seven pounds of fat. Um I can tell you that with almost, you know, 90% certainty, maybe there's some room for error there, but I've lost pretty much a bunch of fat all around my midsection and that was it. Um, so it's been, it's been incredible. Um, this little health thing, this health, really this whole health journey I've been on in the last four ish years to then finally have it end like this. And, and the answer was really just so simple this entire time. Um, I'm telling you, you know, when you've put a lot of time into something and then to have you get rewarded at the end, it just makes it all more worth it. And it, all the steps I took to learn all these different things about my health, 
um, you won't forget them now, you know? So uh, I'm almost in a sense glad this happened now rather than when I was 50 or something, you know? Um, cause by the time I'm 50, if I would have kept going the way I was, I probably wouldn't be nearly as healthy as I will be now when I turn 50. So, um, pretty interesting. I think you guys ought to just look into elimination diets in general and, and functional medicine in general. This guy named, uh, Dr. Mark Hyman, I, I owe it all to him basically. That guy is, uh, really, he's the guy you want to talk to if you're trying to be healthy. I really do believe that. Um, anyway, so we've also just been relatively happy, not just because of my diet and all that. I think, honestly, there's a big change, maybe even my hormones and the chemicals in my brain based off of what's been happening in my gut. But uh, there's a lot to be happy about right now. First off, I, um, I've been selling a lot of cuttings. And... As you guys know, if you've been following along on the YouTube channel, we just have, we've had a lot of success the last three-ish weeks now. And that's sort of why I haven't had a chance to do this. Um, I haven't had a chance to make many of my videos because I, I legitimately put in so much work. I put in three weeks straight of work, pretty much working like 60-hour days for about three weeks. And that, that was including the weekends. Anytime it, it wasn't just uh, miserable outside. If it was 50 degrees, if it was 45 degrees, I should say, I was out there. Um, if it was raining, I was out there, you know. So I was a legitimate farmer these last three weeks. And, you know, I guess a large part of how I'm ha why I'm happy is probably could be attributed to the fact that I was outside every day, the fact that I was working a lot, the fact that I was actively moving, I had more of a purpose. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts to this whole health thing, but I do definitely feel a huge dramatic difference from not eating gluten, I'll tell you that. Um, so anyway, I've just been working real hard, and I, I bare-rooted 55 trees. We, we sold every single one of them. Um people have been overwhelmingly happy about those trees. And I, I knew that they would be, I don't see why you wouldn't. If they're huge, the root systems are massive. Um, unfortunately, some of the people with that particular, who, who engaged in that particular uh, sale, some people had to pay a lot more shipping than they needed to. And others had to pay, uh, actually quite a bit less than they needed to and it sort of all equaled itself out and you know for some people like you know the heavier the package is and the larger the package is the more trees you guys order I was able to save people actually quite a bit in shipping especially if there's people who ordered you know 5 10 15 trees I mean there's a couple of you guys out there maybe you're listening I ended up saving them quite a bit of shipping but for myself it actually cost quite a bit more because uh, I was able for some of them to actually fit maybe even five or six trees per box which is insane and if you're going which most of the people who I, I sold these trees to if you're going all the way to the west coast you know it's it's crazy if, if I send a box the the these bare rooted trees of any kind even if I send just one some of them could be really heavy and you're looking at easily thirty dollars. Some of them were fifty. I had some that were over fifty. Um, I had a couple packages for sure that were in the forties. I mean, it, so it was a it was a struggle in terms of that. And I think maybe next year we should evaluate and think harder, maybe at some some level, on you know, uh, the, the shipping aspect of this to make this more fair for everybody who's in, who's, in, who's doing this instead of charging everybody a standard 30, maybe I could adjust it depending on where they live. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I'll tell you, it's a really fantastic product that I was offering and it's extremely hard to beat. I, I don't think anybody can beat it. Actually, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, the value that these people got was ridiculous and you could tell it was ridiculous because they all sold every single tree every single tree i had available sold and it's been like that um for actually two years now i had a couple trees last year that didn't sell but 
this year every single tree and people were asking me for more uh on a almost you know like an like an every other day basis people were were wondering if i had any more bare rooted trees and i ended up actually because of that those people actually ended up bare rooting maybe an extra five trees in addition to what i had even planned to bare root so it's kind of insane um this whole thing to be honest with you um my plans are for the future obviously we'll figure we'll figure out the shipping a little bit more but i definitely would like to uh continue this practice in in a different sense uh i'm not going to have nearly as many trees next year i mean the patio is like vacant we i did a video um it should be out rather recent uh rather soon and the video is just talking about um you know getting my trees away for the winter time whether we're putting them in the greenhouse whether the, we're putting them away underneath the sunroom you know underneath the sunroom is pretty pretty packed because i have a lot of five gallon size trees we still have the pomegranates in there plus it's kind of just i'm running out of space under there um underneath that sunroom but that whole area um is filled but the greenhouse is almost empty like there is just nothing in there so i wish i took a photo i wish i even had some video maybe to show you guys but i'm telling you there's maybe at most i think there's um i have two rootstock that are in 10 15 they're in 15 gallon size pots and then in terms of that size the 10 and 15 gallon size pots i have probably eight 9, 10, 11, 12. I probably have roughly 12-ish trees. So in total, of all of those larger size pots that I like to grow them in, I probably only have about 15 of those larger, of that larger size, which, which is insane. I mean, there's so much room in my greenhouse, guys. The amount of things I'm going to be able to do in there this year, I think I'm even going to root some cuttings, additional cuttings, I'm also going to do seeds in there. Um, so this is going to be really crazy, this whole process of showing you guys a whole, you know, different side of this whole thing and really getting a lot of trees established, I think, so that I can, um, you know, have, I guess, more trees available to sell to you guys. Um, so that's pretty cool. Honestly, the whole thing is just nuts. I'm even e easier. It's easier to even um, water the trees in the greenhouse, to feed the trees in the greenhouse, to make sure they're off on the right start. So it's going to be really cool, I think, to see how those trees do. Um, and then what also this means for me is that because we have so few trees now on the patio, this frees up a ton of room, a ton of space on the patio, um, a crazy amount. And this allows me then to grow other things. And that's really what we're going to talk about. We're getting to that in this episode of Fruit Talk is that we're going to end up looking at some citrus trees. I'm going to add a couple citrus trees. I actually have one here to my, behind me on my right. We're going to look at um, adding a raspberry plant. We're going to talk about the raspberries for a minute. And we're also going to talk about the strawberries because we're going to create a strawberry bed as well. And I think you're going to really want to pay attention to the specifics of both of those two for a very good reason, because I've, I've learned over the years ways to grow these different things that are just far superior to growing them in a different way. Um, so it's going to be a, it's going to be very interesting, I think, um, when you guys have to hear what I have to say on some of these things like, you know, some of the more typical fruits and, and you know, these typical perennial fruit trees, you can't really grow them in too much of a different way than what is the standard way, right? Like, a, a you know, an apple tree, pears, stone fruits, they're trees, right? You put them in the ground and that's it. There's not really much else you can do, but at least in terms of raspberries and blackberries and things like that, they really need, in my opinion, to be in a raised bed um, if you go further north now down in the south you guys got that warmth you got those really warm soil temperatures for a very long portion of the season so 
you're not really going to have to worry too much about that down there. In fact, maybe things get too out of control down there. But here in the north, certainly putting those particular fruits, even the strawberry, in some sort of raised bed, um, it's so beneficial. And, and we're going to talk about what the plans are exactly with that because it's, it's a little bit more intricate. Uh, but I want to go back really quickly to the the sales that we have right now so not only did we do well with the the bare rooted trees but we're also doing really well with the cuttings and i have a number of varieties here actually and some of them are going for really crazy prices people were upset all over the uh, facebook um our figs um even you know a bunch of the facebook groups people are just genuinely um flabbergasted about the prices that some of these cuttings go for and you know all of you guys should understand how why how and why this is a thing i don't need to explain it to you guys you know we did an entire episode of fruit talk i believe it was fruit talk we did actually it was live it was even live and you guys even contributed and had questions but we talked about fig economics the economics of figs and how it relates actually to tulip mania and we even have because i have you know a business background a financial background um we were actually able to explain this to people in a pretty simple sense you know um for some reason people don't understand this um this whole bidding thing which really is still at this point you know they're flabbergasted about the prices that some of these cuttings go for I'm flabbergasted that they don't understand the basics of economics and the basics of a free market system. It honestly is a little bit sad. And even people in that, you know, these threads, whether it was on our figs or even the Facebook groups, people genuinely tried to explain it to them that there's no reason to feel this way. I mean, people can bid whatever they want to buy, whatever they want to spend, whatever they think it's worth. That's what the cuttings should be worth, right? I'm letting the auction decide. It's an auction, right? These aren't buy it now prices. If you wanted to buy cuttings at a particular price, I have them set here and that's up to you. If you don't want to buy them at that price, then that's okay. But if it's an auction and a lot of uh, really not even a, a frac, it's a very small fraction of the cuttings and the listings I've offered have been auctions, which are started at $10 um at the beginning of the auction you know it has nothing to do with me if the prices go higher and people were really nasty um people were ignorant honestly just completely ignorant to the varieties ignorant to me as a seller ignorant to me as a person um ignorant to um what i've been doing here on this youtube channel what i stand for i mean it's that it's really just quite sad i had people um saying all kinds of crazy stuff there was one woman who apparently was kidding but she said that oh we should go to the person's house and take cuttings off the tree ourselves like like is that it wasn't funny at, at, at all it wasn't even it wasn't even um first off that's one of the craziest things anyone could ever suggest and it's probably one of the uh you know it's happened in the past it's not like that's never happened and in, in all honesty um you know that's like some psychotic stuff so there was a lot of crazy people in that little thing there and i know a lot of you guys came to my defense and um tried to talk some sense in these people but they're ignorant is really all it comes down to some of them are hate are hateful legitimately there's a lot of people guys that hate me you can't be doing this um for as long as i have for putting out as much information as i have for as um you know, for standing for what I believe in to not have any haters. It's like, it's impossible. You know, there's people who have all kinds of weird perceptions of me. And I've talked about a lot about this with, uh, recently with my parents, with, uh, my brother, my friends, um, because they just think for whatever reason that they, you guys maybe are even included in this, that you guys think, you know, who I am to any degree which is whether it's a good thing. I've heard all kinds of things. People have said all kinds of good things about me. People have said all kinds of bad things about me. And most of the time, it's just 
inaccurate. You know, I'm a, I, you could say I'm a public figure. I don't know why people think that I'm a celebrity or some of you guys are, are buying my stuff because I'm some sort of celebrity. I mean, it's such a joke how ignorant some of these people are and jealous. It's really just comes down to hatred and jealousy is, is, is really what it is. I summed it up pretty well in that post, I have to say. Um, but, um, yeah, I just, I think if you're a public figure, which I am, you can't argue I'm not at this point. Um, you're going to have all kinds of perceptions about you that are just wrong and right. Um, whether it's good or bad, as I said, so me being a public figure, I'm telling you guys that if you have any sort of perception about whether it's a celebrity, whether it's a presidential candidate, whether it's, um, you know, just some Joe Schmo like myself who's on YouTube and you think, oh, they must be a good person or they're such a, they're, you know, they're this, they're that, whatever it is. Most of the time you're wrong. You don't, you don't really have any clue and you're only guessing. I mean, that's sort of what the presidential election is about, right? It's like, well, who do I think is going to be the best candidate? You don't know. You never, you won't know until four years goes by. Um, and even four years goes by, you still don't even know what kind of person they are. Uh, if I'm the president, I'm going to be, I'm going to be lying about all kinds of stuff. Sorry guys. You know, um, there's just certain things the American public shouldn't know. Uh, if there's aliens and I find out aliens are real, I'll tell you guys <laughs> in this hypothetical situation. But you know, it just saying like, um, you just really don't know who a person is until you meet them and you spend a lot of time with them. Um, even if you guys met me in person, doesn't mean you know who I am either. You have to be my friend. You have to experience uh, emotions with me. You have to be able to uh, maybe even rely on me. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of to this. There's a lot to this, and maybe you guys get a good estimate, which um, usually I think you can be right about. Is at least Maybe you could say, oh, Ross is a good person, but you, you still really don't know. There's still that percentage of a person that you really have no idea about. I could be a pathological liar. Um, I could be have been lying about everything else, every single thing I've said on this podcast, on these videos, whatever it is, and I could have been putting up a front. I could be an actor. I could be putting on a show. You know, as crazy as that sounds, people believe it. People actually believe that, but it's possible, isn't it? Um, so the point is, is that for good or for worse, you shouldn't have these weird perceptions about people. It's just, it's just ridiculous. But I go on and on and on about the ignorance of that, of those people and the hatred and the jealousy. Some of them just legitimately, in my opinion, just need some help, um, which you know, that's a whole other thing. And, and I don't want to encourage any of these people because who the hell knows? I mean, you really don't know who anybody is on Facebook. Um, you don't know anybody is on some of the people who comment on my videos either. So, you know, you just got to be careful and you know, that's it. You said what I, I have to say about it. Uh, but the, the cuttings again, I've sold so many listings now. It's been fantastic. Um, I sold, I remember, on last Monday, I sold, I think I went to the post office with 60 packages. This last time I went to the post office was probably at least 30, maybe even 40. And then I have plenty more to go again, once again, on Monday. We have listings that are um, being listed uh, and ending then on Sunday or being listed on Friday and ending on Wednesday. So I have two sets of auctions that are happening twice a week. Plus, you have all these different cuttings here, these different varieties that are for buy it now prices. Um, some of them are extremely rare, and uh, people, I don't, what I've been noticing so far is that people have no idea um, what's good about these varieties and what's bad about these varieties. I even try to explain it as much as I can in these listings. Um, it's pretty obvious to me just seeing what people are buying it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and that's just the nature of i guess growing figs is that people are genuinely lost for the most part so 
choosing a variety is extremely, extremely important. And if, you know, if I can help you guys in any way I have, I can definitely attest to that. But, you know, some of these other ones I have here are a bit more experimental and are really just being sold for rarity's sake um, because some of these are just, you just can't find them. Um, and I don't really have too much great information on them just yet, you know, in terms of, you know, a couple of these Thierry varieties that uh, have not fruited for me yet. I mean, I can tell you some information about them, but couldn't tell you, you know, my own personal experience as an example. Um, there's a lot of standard varieties. You know, there's some really good standards here that I'm selling that people just, I don't think really, there there actually has been a lot of people who have been buying like Ronde Bordeaux, Long de Dut, some of the LSU varieties, um, like LSU Tiger and, and uh, Champagne and even Violet de Bordeaux. So people will understand what are the standards and what are the, some of the things you should just go for. But people are just, for whatever reason, don't understand this, I guess. But, you know, Grise de St. Jean is one of the most standard figs you can grow. Um, it is a standard. In France, it should be a, considered a standard here. It does so well in so many different climates. Nero 600M is a Violet de Bordeaux type, same thing. Osborne Prolific, believe it or not, is also a standard. Um, it does extremely well in a variety of climates. It's really underrated, I think, in a dry place. And I had some actually at an experimental station in Connecticut that were out of this world. Um, they have a really awesome dried fruit figgy flavor to them. There's White Marseille, which we've done videos on as well, and that's a standard. Um, there's Calderwood, which is LSU Tiger. We've got, you know, um, Figu Jean, which is, in all honesty, it is one of the earliest figs in existence. Um, it's brand new to me, so I can't really give too much of my opinion on it just yet, but a lot of my friends, people who have been growing it for a long time, a lot longer than me, have good things to say about it. Uh, there's the Daloso. The Daloso is basically a standard here, in my opinion. Pastelier, a standard. Long de Dute, standard. LSU Champagne, standard. Negretta is also a standard here. Um, it's a wild fig that Sergio Carlini found in Italy. And about 10 years ago, it was imported into the United States. And people grow this in so many cold, short season climates. It's one of the earliest figs. La Magdalene is uh, one that's really been impressing me recently. Um, I don't understand personally why a fig like Negra de Agde, um, a fig like Victoria, uh, Moscatel Preto, Raven de Calci is another one. Um, those are really the three I think that really have stood out to me the most is just that people are severely underestimating those figs you know i could have went off and talked about them till till i got you know i don't know white in the face or something but i'm telling you they're they're highly i guess i guess they're underrated because if nobody seems to be that interested in them that means i guess they're underrated you know victoria is one of the best tasting figs you can grow in california when caprified um, it's pretty darn good. It's even good here. It just splits a little bit here. And for that reason, it's not making one of my, uh, my lists, but you can tell it's extremely flavorful. Negra de Agde is, uh, one of Danny Gentile's favorite figs. I mean, it's got a, it's getting a huge reputation. I don't know why people are not trying it. Maybe everybody has it and maybe no one wants it because everybody has it. I don't know, but for some reason, that fig it has a ton of potential, and no one really seems to be giving it any thought. Um, Luzano, I don't even know how many people even have this in the United States. Jade, again, I don't know how many people even have it. it has a ton of potential in um, California with the wasp. Um, Brianzolo Rosso, again, this is a very, very rare Italian fig that I'm offering for an extremely cheap price. If you ask me, um, considering how rare it is. And also it's, again, it's, it's so ridiculously early. I mean, these are like figs that people would kill for, you know, they used to, people are going crazy for green Michurinska 
why not, are people going crazy for Brian Zolo Rosso and and um, and Figu Jean is beyond me because these are just really great options for people in a short season climate. You're trying to find something that does really well, and I, honestly, I don't have enough experience with either one just yet. But I know for a fact Brian Zolo Rosso is going to be a fantastic fig uh, for any short season climate. Rockanera is a new one to me that I've been growing for a couple of years. My friend Joe in um, Canada, this is his family's fig. And I'm telling you, it's actually really, really good. People are going to be surprised, I think, next year when I ripen a bunch of these. And then people are like, whoa, you know, this is actually a really good fig. And I'm offering this basically before anybody even has the opportunity to say anything good about it. You know what I mean? Um, off, also offering the re legitimate Izmir. I don't know how many people even have this in the United States. So, uh, yeah, there's that. There's Stallion, which in my opinion is a standard and should be the best Celeste type that I grow. We'll see. Um, I think Black Celeste is probably going to be even better than them all, but I'm excited for a fig called The One. We'll see. I have a number of them that I really like. Mosque del Preto, I've had people asking me about this fig for years, and for some reason, the interest this year seems rather low. I don't know why. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful fig, and if I was in California, somewhere dry, somewhere warm, um, I would certainly be growing that fig. I, I have no doubts, because the flavor complexity in that and the flavor profile is very different than most figs. Um, extremely well worth growing uh the black portuguese we t i did a thread on our figs about this which actually has some really good um history behind it my friend peter kinderi at the staten island fig festival i met him there one year my first year there i interviewed him actually you can see a video on my youtube channel about it and uh i asked peter about this fig and he told me he has it i found it on our f on um figs for fun way long ago when i first started growing figs this is my first year and i noticed how good it looked and how no one had even really given it much attention because it was a thread it was a post by georgie and a thread there and no one had ever talked about it bell claire has a, a list a, a nursery list of all the varieties they sell and this fig wasn't even on the list so it was kind of strange to me Message Peter, and he said he had it. He gave me some cuttings. I rooted some for him. Gave it back. Saved the variety, basically. Saved it from uh, disappearing, essentially. So, at least that's what he told me. Uh, I'll stick to that story. Um, and then, let's go back here to some other ones that we might have listed that I want to go over. Capulcurt Negra is extremely good. It's a very good fig. Again, Victoria, very underrated in my opinion. Um, it is sort of easy to find, so maybe that is contributing to it. Violet Support, Borgia Soak Grease, they are standards, and they should be basically a, a must-grow. I mean, those are like legitimately must-grows. If I have any must-grows, um, it's definitely one of those two. They're rather similar in my opinion. Um, I really also have been liking Green Michurinska. I was extremely surprised. Col Noir is uh, a must grow as well. It's very similar, if not the same thing, as Sucret. And Sucret is a must grow for sure in any climate. I don't care where you guys live. I think Pastelier is, is a must grow. Don't care where you live. Um, Negra de Agde, I'm pretty darn sure, is going to be in that category as well. Um, in terms of just growing them in every climate, I think they're huge recommendations. Petit Albic, a standard. Barbalone, a standard. You don't hear anything about Barbalone ever. Uh, it's an underrated, under the radar fig variety. I'm gonna have a lot of uh, good things to say about it next year. LSU Huye, a standard, and it fills a really nice flavor profile that you don't normally find. And then, uh, let's see here. Some of the listings we have, I mean, the ones I've listed, 
are essentially the cuttings that I, the varieties I either value the most or have very limited quantity, quantity of um, that I think are worth listing in this sense. Um, you know, if there's, if there really isn't a whole lot of it, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've listed something and then they just disappear, like list created the listing. And then like five minutes later it's sold. And I'm like, what? And I've even had people message me on Figbid. They're like, Hey, can you list this or whatever? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll list it. And then I list it and then it's gone. I'm like, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to help you here. Um, and then we have to basically arrange something where they're like, "Hey, let uh, I'm like, hey, let me know when you're ready because I'm gonna list this thing." And then, and then they sit there and wait uh, for me to list it, which is just, it's crazy. Um, so, in terms of some of the cuttings here that we have um, for auction, these varieties. We have actually quite a few that will be listed tonight. Today's Friday night. Um, it's Friday evening right now. So tonight there will be a whole new set of these, and I'll I'll go to that in just a minute. But Lampiro number one is a. Um, if I had a guess, this would be one of the best tasting figs you could grow. I mean, bar none. It's extremely, extremely good. It resembles a lot of a cold adam that has drying capabilities. It's a type of cold adam, and I would put it, you know, people are really excited about cold adam mutante. I would put this fig right there. People just don't, they don't understand. They're not aware uh, of what figs are good and which ones aren't. That's really why I'm doing this for you guys right now. Um, Narino. Um, I'm telling you, it's it is one of my best figs. I've gone over that so many times. Um, Blanche to do saison, super under the radar, underrated fig. Uh, my friend Eric actually, I sent him some. I think I sent him a tree, and he actually got some fruit this year, and he loved it. Um, this is Michael Grace's favorite, uh, who actually was growing figs for a very long time commercially in Virginia, and he would sell. Um, actually a lot of figs to restaurants and he would sell trees too. He so he told me he sold over 2000 trees in the Virginia area. And um to these restaurants he would sell and they told him that their favorites were obviously the Col de Noms. And one time one of the restaurants there actually was visited by the Queen of Spain and she couldn't believe that she was eating some Col de Dom figs at the meal that she was eating. And he uh, apparently got some huge, like, just great news. I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, that's just super cool to me. And uh, that's just the story he told me one time. But I'm sure he tells everybody that story. <laughs> he told everybody that story. But um, this was his favorite right behind the Cold Adams, and it's obvious why. It really is. Um, hated the Argentile. I am very happy to see that this fig is getting i think the attention it deserves it should be grown everywhere it is extremely good um it rarely cracks it rarely splits someone asked me this i don't know where i saw it somewhere and i don't know exactly where i was or what i was doing i couldn't answer them at the time but someone had asked me about this fig i think it might have been on one of my youtube videos that I need to answer some comments on, but it's got everything. Uh, it literally does. I th actually, yeah, I think it was on my hate of video, but it's it's rain resistant, split resistant. It actually has drying capabilities. Uh, it's extremely flavorful. It is the most complex fig that I grow. The most complexly flavored fig. It's ridiculously good, and uh, it can be grown in any climate. It takes a very long time to establish. So what I would recommend actually is grafting it. Um, and you'll skip the line. You'll skip a number of years. It does take a number of years even when grafted to mature. So as some of these figs do, even if you graft them, you, you need like maybe even two years before the fruit will mature. And the fruit matured for me this year even further. And I was just blown away. Absolutely blown away by that variety. Dell's Ermitons talked a lot of, a lot about this variety, but not a whole lot this year. 
Um, it is a very good fig. Uh, unfortunately, it's extremely late, but it is one of the best tasting figs out there. Uh, I, honestly, I would say this one for people who live in a you know a dry and warm place for the long season that's a must grow i just also think hate of the argentile is just a must grow for everybody i don't care who you are that's like in the same category for me as smith you got to grow smith you got to grow hate of you know you got to try black madeira at some point delson wami ron's getting a lot of um praise and i'm still waiting for me to really get a decent representation of this variety it's just been taking me so long and i've air layered it and i've taken cuttings for people and i've just i finally put it in the ground and i because i'm putting it in the ground or it is in the ground now it should really do something significant for me this upcoming season and um that's just what i'm hopeful for you know so that we can get a better representation of it to see really just how well it does here but I have no doubt is one of the best tasting figs. And I have no doubt that it does well at a dry, warm place. Will it do well in my climate? I just don't, I don't know yet, but pretty insane how good that fig is. We also have Colonel Littman's Black Cross. Uh, you know, that's like an upgrade to Black Madeira in so many ways. And it's really as close as you can get to a Black Madeira while being upgraded, in my opinion. So for me, I'm really high on that fig, and I have a number of trees now on the ground. The um, De La Senora Hivernenka is, in my opinion, superior to the Black Madeira in almost every way for anybody in a rainy short season. Maybe not short season, but definitely someone who has an, a problematic climate. It just it avoids all the issues because of its hang time. It's really three to five days. You could wait longer and pick it at six or seven, but... You could pick this fig at day three, and it's still pretty good. I mean, that's like insane. The commercial ability potential is there. It's um, it's a winner for sure. Um, so I'm really happy to see people are, are interested in that fig. People obviously know what's going on when you know watching my videos. The Paradiso Ciro, same thing. You guys saw the video on it. It's extremely, extremely good. Um, I forgot that I even gave it to my friend uh, Brian down in Louisiana last season. Um, you know, often what I do is I either I send stuff to a couple of my friends. Um, I try to send stuff to my friends, but normally I'll select a couple growers. And this year I probably selected about about six or seven different growers, and I just sent them a ton of stuff. Um, and Brian just last year got a ton of stuff from me. And he actually grew this out, and he said that it doesn't split for him, which was really my main negative about it and what I hope that it won't do. <laughs> so if it doesn't split for him and he gets way more rain than me, then that's a that's a really good sign. Um, it's so, so good. And it's early. Um, yeah, I don't even know what else to say. The Rosalino is a stupidly underrated fig, and I hope that people start thinking about this fig more. I'm sure there's going to be all kinds of complainers at some point that say, oh, it's why is it getting so much attention? It's so cheap. You can find it so easily. You know, it's like, well, it's extremely good. That's why. In fact, I might even consider it, it is in my top five, I think I'm gonna. Huh, it's almost in my top five. I think I need another season to really see uh, to, to get more data on how it's gonna really, really perform. Um, because of those drying capabilities, it's so good. And I would put it up there almost. It's pretty close. If I think it's as good as I think it is, it's. It almost might even be my third best fig. And it would replace almost, it could potentially replace Malta Black, Azores Dark. Um, that's how good that fig is to me. And then, of course, we've got White Triana, which really doesn't get a whole lot of attention. But I did the videos on it. I actually gave away a couple sets of them, actually a few sets of them, 
to people this year. Um, we did some giveaways. We raised some money for charity. And people just went friggin' bonkers for it on this last one. Uh, and deservedly so. I, I really do think that's uh, one of the best figs I grow for sure. And now that I have it in the ground, I think it's almost... It's improved even further than what I... I would feel a little bit bad because if people are just buying one of each individual cutting and then they're not even really succeeding with that cutting, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, you know? Um, I don't know. I, I just, I would really feel bad, especially for some of you guys out there who are really just relatively new and you're always trying. I mean, that's most of the people who join figs and start growing figs as a hobby like this, you know, they learn about them through my channel. So, yeah, not Harvey. So I, that's that's I think hashing it out there is really what I wanted to do. If somebody has some sort of uh, you know thought on what I just said, let me know in the comments. I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. Um, all right. So moving on away from these cuttings and things, let's talk about what we're gonna we're gonna add to the yard this year. One other point I want to make. Is that in terms of these figs uh, we talked about light penetration recently we talked about planting them we talked about pruning them and especially in the pruning videos we talked about that light penetration and you can see this is a really good example right here this is my Smith which I've said prior many multiple times many multiple times okay um, but this particular tree has not done well for me in the ground. It just doesn't seem to want a fruit. And I, my theory is that it doesn't want a fruit because it just uh, it doesn't like being pruned. And I also have the, the knowledge now for sure, it's a guarantee, that you need the right amount of light penetration. Smith is very erect, and you can tell right here that, especially down here at the base, Essentially, Smith is such a very close spacing here. I mean, this is maybe like a half an inch away from each other, these trunks. You can see there's three coming up from the base. And these three trunks, I had a couple of them this year that were just massive. And they just grew straight up in the air. They had leaves and no fruit. And it was very confusing to me why this was happening until I finally figured it out. But it's obvious because as the tree gets wider, it starts out like that V down here at the bottom. And then it starts to grow out and out further and further so that when you get to these higher points in the tree, it starts to get that light penetration. And I just wanted to talk about that because it really just writes that point home, I think. Even though Smith didn't fruit, it just obviously needs to be further away. It needs to have more light penetration uh, or it's the pruning theory, so who knows? But um, just an interesting little way of describing it, I thought. So let's talk about the the raspberries and the strawberries here. As I said, I've had immense success in the past with my raspberry plants and my blackberry plants. And the only reason I think that has happened is actually because they were in a raised bed. And I planted them in a raised bed, and they did so phenomenally well that I first off was shocked, and then I decided to move them. And I was getting so many uh, raspberries that I didn't really even think much of it, that when I moved them, I wouldn't have any issues because, you know, they've done so well. In fact, they used to give me a pint of raspberries every single day from August till November 1st. Um, that's per plant. So if I had six plants, I'd be getting six pints. And it was a lot of work to pick all that fruit every single day. I'll tell you that right now. Um, it's crazy. So Anne, has, uh, Anne is one of the varieties, the new ones I want to select, because it is one of the more productive yellow varieties uh it is probably the standard right now of the yellow raspberries um and what i've done now since is actually i moved them and then i realized this whole raised bed thing and then i built myself a raised bed filled it in with soil that we took from our bare rooted figs and we now have a raised bed again 
of raspberries. Unfortunately, they're going to have to really root themselves in that raised bed. It's going to take them a while to develop the root systems, but they're now in a raised bed, which is great. And I also have room. I have a couple spots in this raised bed for some raspberry plants. So we are going to plant some Ann, and this is the one variety I wanted and ended up, I killed it. And we're just replacing it. I have, um, what is the name of the other one here? I have double gold, I believe. It might even be fall gold. Let's find out here. We have Caroline, which is incredible. Double gold, very tasty pink raspberry. And then royalty, which is a purple one. We'll see how that one works out. I also even have a black raspberry pretty much right next to them. And I know that people say don't do that, but we're trying that out to see really what the deal is, if it's all nonsense. And I think it is mostly nonsense for most people. But um, anyway, the point is, is that Royalty is a really good purple one. We just needed to find a really good yellow one, and that's Ann. We're going to replace it. We'll see which color we like. We still haven't figured that out just yet because uh, we just haven't had the production. They haven't been in a raised bed, and I think also the water where they're planted, they weren't getting enough water either. So combination of increasing the water, raising the soil temperatures in my climate is going to make them go bananas. And um, that's all it is. That really is all I really wanted to mention to you guys about them in that I think if you're growing them at a certain you know, climate, especially if you're further north, you want to put them in a raised bed. It's one of those things as well because – you know, I can't put a, an apple or a stone fruit or, you know, a pear or some of the more standard fruiting plants in a raised bed because they just wake up too soon. And normally they flower as soon as they wake up. And that's just horrible because a late frost comes in and kills off the flowers. You don't get any fruit. But, and, and raspberries, I should say, and even strawberries, this almost never happens. They're almost a guarantee. They're such a standard fruit that you can grow. You should never buy raspberries or strawberries ever again, ever. It's one of the things that I just really don't get why people even go to the store and get them because they're so much worse, especially the strawberry. And you can get so much food at home at pretty much a very, very consistent time of the year. I mean, my strawberries produce for five months out of the year. Your raspberries probably produce maybe four and a half months out of the year. Um, it's insane. So the Mar de Bois is the strawberry that I really recommend. been saying it for years. Really a big fan. Also the Rucker Scarlet. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do just yet, but I am going to create a, a strawberry bed. Now, I used to have them underneath my blueberries. Um also have my persimmons there, which are going to create a much larger canopy and kind of share that space with the blueberries. We even have a che over there. It's just a giant mess at some point in the future. <laughs> uh, but underneath on the, on the canopy was the Mar de Bois strawberries. It was huge, and it plant, you know, it really put out a ton of berries every single year. The issue is, is that a lot of them died this year because I neglected that whole entire bed, and a lot of weeds and a lot of grass came up, shaded out the strawberry plants, and killed most of them. Um, it's kind of crazy how easy it is for strawberry plants to die, especially if they get no light or if you smother them in some way. If you put like tons of wood chips over them, you can kill a lot of them. Uh, it's not the end of the world. you know. They, they multiply very quickly, but uh, I guess it's kind of easy to kill them. And I'm out... For most of the bed, most of them are dead. I would say about 80% of the bed is dead. I de-weeded the whole thing. I weeded the whole thing, not de-weeded it. And um, we're just making up words here. And then uh, we essentially came up with the idea after I, I watched that video of edible landscaping in Afton, Virginia. Michael McConkie did a tour. We did. We, I think we talked about it here on, on the channel, and uh, he showed me a way of growing strawberries where 
you can plant them up very create a raised bed that's extremely high so that you don't have to get down on your knees and pick these things you can pick them at your waist you know it's kind of like at the level of a table and then you it just makes strawberries so much easier now the other big thing with strawberries is that you got to net them here the birds get them the squirrels get them the groundhogs get them the skunks get them everything loves the strawberry and i net them and then nothing gets them problem is the guys who mow on lawn tore up my net so at that point i was just completely neglecting the whole thing i got all my strawberries in the spring and then completely neg neglected them after they destroyed the whole area and then all the weeds came in and i was just like all right whatever and essentially the strawberry uh needs a new home so i dedicated an area we're going to create a raised bed it's not going to be as high as i want but what I, I have a little solution here for my problems is that we're going to put a hinge on the raised bed. So it's going to, it's going to flip open the top of it. We'll have it something pretty reasonably light, kind of like a cold frame. But instead of having plastic on the cold frame, it's going to be bird netting. And that's going to keep everything out. I'm going to have perfect strawberries. Very easy to pick them. I don't have to deal with a net anymore. There's no way that the people are going to destroy it. It's going to be beautiful. Plus, it's a dedicated area to the strawberry, which I think I really need now that uh, everything is getting so shaded in uh, different areas and things. So it'll be, yeah, it'll just it'll work out perfectly, and that's that's my plan. I'll just keep you guys updated on that. And then what I really want, because we have so much room now in the patio, is that we're going to have a lot more varieties for trialing purposes and i've already acquired not too many varieties but if we want to trial something in a five gallon size pot we are and that's what we're doing we have a lot more room for that especially in terms of the fig trees but what i really have had great success with now is actually the citrus trees they're doing so well this guy here behind me i've realized i'm pretty just convinced the rootstock took over years ago this is like four or five years ago and I had no idea what I was doing and it's just never going to fruit and if it does it's going to be crap so I'm going to I'm going to get a couple I'm gonna just going to get scion wood for my own trees plus I'm going to order a couple trees and I'm going to do some grafting on this guy to cover this maybe even get some fruit off of it next year who knows and then since our finger lime is doing great I'm not I'm considering this blood lime the Australian blood lime, these finger limes I know are so, so good. Now, I also want a, a legitimate lime. I use them a lot in my cooking. I use lemons a lot less, but certainly would be sweet to have a lemon tree. So I'm going to think about, I have a, this use, this lime quat right here that actually has fruit on it right now that I could pick. But the useless lime quat, I'm not a big fan of this, and I've talked about this in another video. It says it's a cross between a Mexican key lime and a kumquat. I'm not a big fan. Maybe it is good in a cocktail, but eating it in terms of a kumquat, you know, where you just eat it with the skin, you eat the flesh as well, it doesn't seem to wow me at all. Using it as a lime, squeezing it on your food, doesn't impress me at all so this particular citrus unless it's impressing me this year it's really quite a disappointment um, now we got to find a lime a legit lime we got to find also a legit considering a legit lemon tree considering this Australian blood lime And then the other thing I'm considering is maybe even a potential another kumquat, just simply because this guy over here hasn't fruited. We'll graft the kumquat onto that, but the kumquat is a really fantastic fruit for filling a nice gap. I want to have fruit all year. I don't even know if I can have enough of these kumquat trees, to be honest with you. So I'm thinking about potentially another one. And then here it is right here a blood orange 
And this would be the only real sweet citrus that I attempt to grow. The only simple fact, actually this is it right here, the Amoa 8. There's also here the Australian Red Finger Lime. I had a Caracara Naval Orange at one point, but I think if I'm going to grow any sweet citrus and really try hard to do it, it's going to be a Blood Orange because they're just some of the best. They just are, the, in my opinion, the best fresh tasting citrus tree. This one here actually selected for cold hardiness. US 119 citrus consisting of an acidless sweet orange and the other half consisting of a citramello and a trifolate orange very tasty fresh eating citrus with a sugary sweet orange flavor balanced with the acid and bitterness of the citramello and the trifolate orange so far it's Ho they're hoping it's hardy to t 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's that's interesting. That's something new. Never heard about that. Anyway, um, I think it's actually this Amoa 8 here, only recently made available in the United States. Amoa 8 is an Italian hybrid of Ivana Mandarin and Moro Blood Orange, hence the name Amoa. This one's truly spectacular, as if all our favorite flesh, fresh eating citrus qualities were crammed into one fruit. I mean, it's got to be. It's got to be. And if you're going to try one tree that's sweet, because you just, guys, if you're in this climate like me, it's just going to be very difficult um, to get sweet citrus. This actually looks really good. Look at this Sanguinelli Blood Orange. Um, I trust One Green World about the citrus more than I trust Four Winds Growers because I think they, whoever is over there, I forget the guy's name. Maybe it's Arlie Powell. He knows his citrus. Whoever it is over there knows their citrus. And this Eustace Lime Quat so far seems to be useless. Eustace is useless. I don't want any grapefruits. They take forever. Good luck. Citramellos or tangellos. I don't even know. Never even had one. You know, don't seem all that appealing to me. It's a variegated kumquat. Palmellos. Never had one. Probably should try one, huh? Here's a lemonade lemon. Don't want one for that, I don't think. It would be cool to make some lemon cello, wouldn't it? Smith Red Blood Orange. Well, got to consider these, you know what I mean? I mean, that Amoa 8, I don't know. I feel like that's got to be the one to try. Here's the Kiefer Lime. Agami Kumquat. What is this? Yosemite, Yosemite Gold Mandarin? Looks pretty good. Well, anyway, guys. I think that's just pretty much where we're going to end this one. You know, here's the Van Niglia Sanguinglo. Holy crap, we butchered that one. Um... You know, I will say that Four Winds has a much larger selection of Italian types of citrus. The question is, which one is good? I don't know. And it might be better just to go with something that's standard, like Eureka or the Kiefer Lime. I uh, just don't know. Oh, they actually sell rootstock. Holy crap. Whoa. That would be worth getting. These guys are really stepping up their game here. Orange gift box. What is in this stuff? Anyway. Oh, Ponderosa, I think, is another standard. 
Um, so I'm going to make my decisions. We'll see which ones I end up coming out with. I'll let you guys know. I'm sure. But we're going to have these sent to me in the spring. Uh, sometime after my frost. I'll schedule it for after the frost. We'll do the grafting relatively at the same time um, on this big rootstock I have here. And we'll have ourselves about, I don't know, we have about four citrus right now. Maybe I'll settle for six, but I might even go for eight. It's just difficult keeping them in the house and having a place for them. Because uh, they turn into house plants, and I only have so much room for house plants. And yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, maybe I could figure something out. You know, I think that's kind of the key here is having room indoors for them, not room outdoors for them. Because we've got plenty of room outdoors now. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Fruit Talk. Hit that subscribe button. Leave me a review. Uh, like us on Facebook, Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. I think I just said that. <laughs> Check us out on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. Um, really appreciate all the support you guys have been giving me. Um, you know, especially in the cuttings that we've been listing, the trees that we've been listing. It's been a really successful sale. I can't even tell you. Even if I sold nothing from this point on, I'd be extremely, extremely happy. So... Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, we will see everybody soon. All right. See you next week. Um, hoping to make this more of a regular thing now that my life is more normal. So we'll see you guys uh, next week. Take care.